Good evening. My name is Bill Michael, and it's my privilege to be the executive director of the Reva and David Logan Center of the Arts. And it's so wonderful to welcome you here for what I'm sure is going to be a really special evening. We are thrilled to once again be partnering with the Center for the Study of Race, Politics, and Culture uh, to support tonight's program. Uh, and before I say a bit more about that, I hope for those of you that have not been back to the Logan Center in a while, it's so great to have you back. And now that you're back, I hope you'll come back often to see many great programs, including, <laughs> including, if you have not yet stopped in the cafe to see the exhibition, Truth and Beauty in the Hard Places, featuring the work of Tara Betts and Ronaldo Hudson, in a, partnership, in a partnership between CSRPC, the Posen Center, and the Logan Center. I really hope you'll do that. And because you know you're dying to come back here tomorrow night, I invite you to come back tomorrow night for the closing reception from 6 to 8, in which uh, Tracy Matthews will be leading a conversation with Ronaldo and Tara. And it's going to be a really terrific celebration of that really powerful exhibition. This week, though we've not made a big deal of it, because we're going to really celebrate next year, but this week actually marks 10 years ago when we opened the doors to begin to preview the space before the building was even completely done. And one of the things that I hope is true about the Logan Center is that it has become a place that is not only a great space to encourage creativity in our students and faculty at the University of Chicago, but that it has benefited from being a small part uh, in working with an incredible group of artists whom the South Side of Chicago and the Chicago call home. And that over these 10 years, because we have benefited from working with such incredible artists, that we've become a place that really demonstrates the power of art to build community and create change. That happens not just because of the building, that happens because of incredible people. And I am fortunate and we are fortunate to work with an incredible group of colleagues, many of whom are artists themselves. And tonight is special because it was created and curated by one of those incredible colleagues whose relationships with artists and this community and passion and for art and community has really contributed to what the Logan Center is. That is my colleague, Emily hooper Lansana, an incredible artist, an incredible arts administrator, and an incredible creator. Please join me in welcoming Emily to the stage. Thank you so much for being here. Good evening. Good evening. I am so thrilled and honored that you decided to spend tonight with us. These past two years have been hard, is it true? Yeah. We have been through some things, and one of the things that has gotten many of us through is our stories. And our stories matter. Our stories are a way that allows us to remember that we are not alone even in a time where we may feel so very far apart from who we understand ourselves to be and what we have understood our world to be. This project would not have come to fruition without the incredible support of the Center for the Study of Race, Politics, and Culture with special thanks to Tracy, Marilyn, and Beth. Thank you. tell you that story of how honored I feel as an artist to have been given the opportunity to fully realize a dream of mine. I'll get into some tears and I won't be able to do the show, so I'm just going to say thank you. Um, I want to introduce tonight by saying that over the last 30 years, there's a way that I teach stories when I'm trying to cultivate space for people to connect with their stories. And very often that is about connecting with our personal stories and our cultural identity. And many, many years ago I thought, what would happen if I did this with a group of poets? And they responded to the experience in poetry. And we did that and it was amazing. And I've always wondered what would happen if I did it to a group of, did this process with a group of artists across disciplines. And that is the realization of what we, you will see tonight. It has been significantly impacted by our effort to create workshop and create space and connect across the various divides of the pandemic over the last several months. It is the realization of many stories, um, an amazing and incredible group of artists, and I want you to, as you listen, think, 
That might be your story, that might be my story, that might be our story. I want you to understand that tonight is an experiment. It is breaking the walls. It is uh, not traditional. And it is a whole lot of love. Thank you for being here, for remembering ourselves whole. Woo! What did I first think about this project, thinking of ourselves whole? I thought it was just like interested when she said, look, um, this is, I would like to do this, can you do it? I was like, I mean, when do I tell you no? So, <laughs> so that's, that's, it was kind of, um, it was kind of no brain in that sense, right? It's just, you know, a brother telling a sister, okay. When she brought the idea up to me about this workshop, about doing a storytelling workshop with multidisciplinary artists and thinking about what that could lead to. It was really compelling, uh, and I wanted, to be, I wanted to be a part of it. I was just honored to be invited to participate. And then we went to this idea of what choices do we make that begin to influence the cultural environment that we're a part of. So as we grow, we make choices that influence who we become. We make choices and begin to define ourselves by our friendships, how we spend our time, what kind of educational choices we make, where we choose to live, or what environment we are living in if we feel like we didn't have a choice about that environment. Who um, are the people who are around us? How are we spending our time? These kinds of things that, in, that influence kind of like the, the cultural space that we make for ourselves. That's kind of what my work is all about, is remembering things and then just retelling them. Um, whether I'm writing, whether I'm dancing, um, anything, you know, in process, even with other projects where I'm just a collaborator or a supporter of a project, that's all, like, it informs everything that I do. Um, and I feel like all of our lives are informed by our past and our memories, and, you know, nothing is ever lost, even if we don't remember. And if anything poetry has done, right, is kind of present the whole of me, whatever, you know, the W-H-O-L-E. It's been interesting to, th to think about it as storytelling and then to realize um, what's at the heart of, of stories and that's like people and their histories and connections. And it was interesting in that when we sat down to share, it was an immediately a very vulnerable um, space. Like, but one, um, I should say it was a very comfortable space that allowed people to be really vulnerable. And I felt like, um, the level of sharing amongst people who were relative strangers, you know, just a week before was, I guess, given the spaces that Emily curates and, and, and cares for, it's not that surprising that that would happen. And I really appreciate that because it, it helps you kind of just kind of break the ice and be comfortable um, telling your stories. So it was, it was pretty amazing. It was interesting. It was very interesting. Um, not what I expected. I'm not gonna lie. Um, when we were first talking about having these workshops together, I was really set in the old ways that I've had writing workshops, which is like you come in, read a couple poems, and we're gonna like write out some lists and like generate these ideas together. And what I wasn't expecting was such an open space where we can just talk and I think sometimes that I get so hung up on the words me being a writer I'm so focused on the wording right sometimes I lose the feeling and I'm, I'm looking less at how I feel and what's um, in front of me and more at how I can tell the story so I think that our workshops were really beautiful because we were just speaking with each other and it was interesting to me because hearing other people's stories brought out a lot of my own stories and I started talking about things that I didn't even expect to talk about or plan to talk about. I think I had an entire idea of like what this project would be for me, what this workshop would be for me. And being with other storytellers brought out so much of my own emotion, which I think is the power of storytelling, right? Like hearing other people's stories and being able to find your own truth in them. To have the ability to then think about our, our, ourselves, our inclinations, our histories, and then to be able to um, reflect on what we've been carrying in relation to what other people have been carrying and, and, to, and to consider that as like the root of um, like the material that then we could use to generate stories, I thought was uh, like 
really, I think the word I'm looking for is meaningful. Like, I think that kind of space is really important, you know? But when I thought about, like, what the subject matter is, the thing of ourselves whole, I had to kind of figure out, well, what piece of me am I still trying to reconcile with or have not necessarily reconciled with through the work, right? Um, or have not explored as much as I could have, right? Because again, to reconcile is a, is a really big, big assignment for an art, <laughs> for an art, artwork. But just like what I haven't really dealt with, you know, in the context of the, of the whole of myself, right? Um, so, and a lot of that really came about in the workshops. I, I learned a lot, um, you know, it takes a lot to facilitate uh, something like storytelling. And, you know, I realized that once I was like engaging in some of that, but it also allowed me to see all the human connections that we have just through storytelling. It wasn't even through the art practice that we each had. It was more so like the storytelling that brought us together and I thought that was really beautiful. your mama tried to teach you? Was it a commandment or a prayer? Did she teach it to console or control? At what moment did you actually come to understand the scripture? Have you understood it yet? Tell me the stories that come from your paper cuts as your fingers riffle through the pages over and over and over. Give me some insight into the chapped skin on your lips from the nervous biting. Let me aid the headaches from the lack of truth finding. The words make sense, but I'm not sure I read them right. They cannot see me through my nearsighted lenses. They cannot wrap my head scarves and fry the hot water cornbread quite like she can. They fail to hold my hand as we cross the street into battered jungle gyms. They will not tell the tales of my adolescence lurking through the hallways. They do not look in disbelief when I cry and then try to wipe my tears with sandpaper. When I finally go to lay down in green pastures, I am hugged around my rigid shoulders. There's no way I'm supposed to feel this comfort, this faith. She would never actually allow it. Sometime, somewhere, I am meant to be working on something. I am meant to be drilling my sorrow into prayer and coming back out again on the straight and narrow, tethered and healed, unbroken. No queer kaleidoscopic vision of beauty with tattered attempts at therapy. We do not claim thee. Did your mother's mother teach her this scripture?
Look at you now. Oh, the time has come when I look in the mirror now. I see my mama. Oh, how beautiful she is. She is she and she is me and me is smiling just a little bit between the brows and closed lips. I shaved them once when I was 10. Now they grow out toward the glass from a face that was once my father's and is now shifting into my mother's. Straight from her womb and his spit tones of yellow and red and beige brown. From the top of my spine to the bottom of my ass, my back hurts from reparenting myself. Then again, from accepting my mama as my mother after 25, she says the resistance is in my blood. My daddy proves to me more that this is true. It'll always be at the tip of my tongue, same as the knot at the back of my throat, ever present and omniscient. When I was little, I would dunk my head in the water of the bathtub and imagine that I was a part of a great big sea. I would imagine that I was this little mermaid on the south side of Chicago and it didn't matter where I lived because I was like, Ariel, who? Okay. And... I would see how long I could hold my breath underwater, but I always knew when it was time to come back to the land. After my grandfather passed, nothing made sense. Not even the sea in our little bathroom on 59th Street. And so one day while walking with my mom, I said, I want to be baptized. <laughs> and before I knew it, I was dressed in all white from head to toe, being submerged in the baptism pool in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. That same year, we didn't have any hot water. So my Auntie Dot who was my grandfather's best friend may both of them rest in peace now she had us come over and she ran us all hot baths and I had so many questions at that time about why is all this happening what's going on like why is my grandfather still gone (laughs) like so many questions but I never questioned the love of Dot, my auntie Dot, because it was so present in my life. Even when it felt like she was far away, she was always rooting for me and my family. So we left her house feeling washed anew in love and care. And a few years after that, I would find myself at the bottom the bottom, the depths of a white suburban pool, reaching out for the sky. I was thinking if they can see me, then they will know that I'm drowning. If they can see me reaching 
out they will know that I'm drowning but nobody believed me nobody believed me nobody believed me Gotta catch my breath, gotta catch my breath, gotta catch my breath Can anybody see me down here? Can anybody feel me down here? Can anybody see me down here? Can anybody hear me down here? fake like I don't know how I made it like I don't know how I got out of that pool how I am still surviving (laughs) this anti-black world and I realized like miracles are not to be intellectualized you can't have a outline and resources and everything I am the resource (laughs) my my words are the resource this body this life is a resource and proof of the people who saved me Like the 
to my yang, sun in the rain, a kiss to my pain. I'm shocking balance, never forget my name, but forget the shame and go against the grain. I got some moments I regret, but I lay those memories to rest. My heart full of chambers, full of ammo. I don't pull the trigger, that's my shadow. So please forgive me when I'm wrong. Oh, please don't forgive me when I'm gone. Cause sometimes I feel I'm on the brink. I see foggy mirrors hold the sink. Cause I'm shocking balance in these songs. Yeah, I'm shocking balance in these songs. Yeah, I'm shocking balance in these songs. Yeah, I'm shocking balance in these songs. Don't focus on money, I waste it. 
The moment is now, I can take it. The moment is now, I can take it. The fuck is on time that I waste it. The fuck is on money I waste it. The moment is now, I can take it. Yeah. Shot is a laid up, he's so breezy, should be the like makeup. Stop spending your money, just save up. Little shorty who's in on potential. Don't she know confidence becomes essential? When you know that you'll become a blow That's just the shit, the vision of our mental. Oh, can't imagine all things you've been through. Like you've been told all the days you're the blue. Simming them problems like prayers inside them got powers to solve them so no one's the shoot. Talk about it when you walk in the booth. Pulling the pen like they give the two. Shedding the layers and finding the truth. So don't be scared, forget the people that never care. Cause life ain't fair, never been losing my always prepared. So don't be scared, forget the people that never care. Cause life ain't fair, never been losing my always prepared. Don't focus on how did I waste it? Don't focus on money I waste it. The moment is now I can take it. The moment is now I can take it. I don't focus on time that I waste it. Don't focus on money I waste it. The moment is now I can take it. The moment is now I can take it. Don't focus on time that I wasted. Don't focus on money I wasted. The moment is now I can take it. The moment is now I can take it. Don't focus on time that I wasted. Don't focus on money I wasted. The moment is now I can take it. The moment is now I can take it. Get into it in my bag, yeah. Building something that will last, yeah. Phoenix rising from the ash, yeah. Phoenix rising from the ash, yeah. Get into it in my bag, yeah. Building something that will last, yeah. Phoenix rising from the ash, yeah. Phoenix rising from the ash, yeah. Don't be doubting me, saying that they proud of me. I was doubting me, but I'm so proud of me. Those are it, ayy. Those who doubted me, saying that they proud of me. I was doubting me, but I'm so proud of me.
in true Gloria fashion, I am asking for support from my community to uh, figure out where we're going to put this next frame. I, uh, I started this uh, storytelling workshop with different ideas and immediately went into wanting to honor the black and brown women in my life who have helped me heal and who um, who you see up here today in words, in phrases like, don't hold back, in phrases like, you are enough, phrases that I hold near and dear to my heart, and also that are placed on my bathroom mirror. I also want to specifically thank uh, Emily for allowing me this opportunity. But I also want to thank two special people that helped me throughout this project, um, and that is uh, Delaila Di Salgado, as well as Ashley Bussey. So without further ado, I hope you enjoyed the video. My name is Gloria Talamantes. Um, I go by the name of Glow. I'm originally a graffiti artist. Um, that's where my foundation uh, comes from in my practice. And I am a community artist, um, mostly visual artwork um, and murals. Uh, a lot of what I do is uh, very engaging. Um, usually takes a lot of collaboration um, between other artists and myself. I also curate murals um, and I run a project called the Brown Wall Project. So I got into graffiti when I was in high school. I had friends who were doing it. Um, I actually got really interested in it in grade school um, through a couple of friends who were kind of just doing it throughout the neighborhood and stuff. But it wasn't until high school, my high school years, that I really um, became more involved. But when I was starting to paint graffiti, I, um, I would always um, have, you know, these black book sessions with um, elders, um, people who were painting since, you know, the 80s. And, um, and so they would tell me um, stories of how things would happen amongst crews and um, who did what and, you know, things like that. Um, so for me, it's always been important to listen, uh, to observe, um, so that I can actually learn um, history. Um, I also love history, so I'm just kind of like a nerd um, about history and like, especially when it's like cultural history, um, things that I'm into. Um, and, and for me, that's a little bit of a lot, right? Graffiti is like street culture. It's youth culture, it's all these things into one, um, one practice. So yeah, storytelling has always been, at least for me, something that I've encountered through, through graffiti. So my experience with uh, the, the artists that participated in this storytelling um, project um, was actually really beautiful. I really appreciated the way that, you know, um, people were able to kind of pinpoint different things and I just really love the way that Emily um, opened up each session um, because it was really unexpected. In, in not expecting a, a traditional way of storytelling, it just felt like you were, you know, with family. I was having a hard time deciding because I feel like we, we told so many stories and there were so many things that I felt like I could talk about um, because it wasn't you didn't have to choose like something crazy, like you didn't really have to think too deeply about what, you know, what stories you wanted to tell. But I am a huge music fan. I love music, I love lyrics, like lyricists, um, and I love words. And so um, for me, uh, what I ended up doing was I ended up thinking about some of my um, more current journey, right, in life. And, you know, I've been, I, f I, f I feel like I've been on a healing journey. Although healing never stops, I wanted to um, focus on what is it that made me or helped me heal. And it wasn't what, it was who. 
Uh, for me, it was the people that were surrounded um, around me and, and people who I chose to surround myself with. And so in that, I realized, well, there are different stories and different things that have happened um, that have helped me um, along this journey. And I wanted to honor women who are in my life who have either told me things that have helped me um, get through these little hurdles of life um, and really honor them in ways that I, you know, that aren't so in your face, um, but also, you know, that took me back and really, um, actually they took me so, so far back that I even like engaged in looking through histories of our text message threads and things like that. Um, and what I ended up doing was, you know, I, I am the type of person that if I hear someone say something to me and it just kind of like either lifts, uplifts me or it inspires me or it just gets me in a better mood, I write it down. And so what I wanted to do was, again, honor, on, honor the women who have been doing that for me, who have helped me through this uh, healing journey. And so I just took small phrases um, and I wanted to put them on these mini billboards that would then be installed in public spaces. And so that's what I worked on. So I'm excited about it because I feel like this is just the beginning of something that I can keep doing. Um, so prior to starting this project, I had done a, like a bigger size billboard having a space for them that's uh, more intimate and not that street blocks are intimate but I feel like I they don't need to be in a you know in a busy intersection because people just kind of ride by or walk by and don't pay too much attention I think that it's everyday people who maybe I want well I guess that's what it is right like I want everyday people from the neighborhoods um, to look at them and, you know, hopefully get something from that, um, from that phrase that they see and take it and hopefully it helps them as much as it helps me. Welcome. 
and she was nurtured. She was cared for, and she watched, and she listened, and she watched, and she listened to everything that was happening all around her, all that she could see and all that she could hear. She took it in. And she grew into womanhood. And this woman saw that there was so much need. And she wanted to do all that she could to respond. And so she became a mother, a nurturer. And she gave, and she cared for, and she lifted. And she saw that there was a need, and so she became a healer, a doctor, a nurse. Knowing the herb and the time and the remedy, she mixed it together to heal. And she saw that there was a need, and so she became an activist calling forth the voice to march and speak for justice, calling for truth and power and for change. And she saw that there was a need to build bridges. And so she built connection after connection after connection. And she saw that there was a need for new structures. And so she became an architect going from the foundation to the spire. She built new places. And she saw that there was a need. And so sometimes she became a preacher, saying what she thought would heal the people. Sometimes she thought there was a need for a doctor, a lawyer, a teacher, a mother, a guide, and she became, 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 tired. So tired. And in that, she collapsed. And in that falling, she was broken, open. And in the breaking, she could do nothing but rest. And so she rested. And in the resting, she began to dream. And in the dreaming, she released Leia. And in the resting, and in the dreaming, she came into herself. She was so much lighter. She was so much freer. that she looked at herself, she explored herself, she discovered herself, and she 
she found out that she had something that she had had no idea she had. She had wings! She found those wings and she stretched them. She explored them. say that what a gift it's been to be a part of this process. Um, Emily has this way of making the act of creation into an act of healing. And I think it was uh, much needed uh, on my part. For this uh, storytelling project, I made a sculpture out of wood and light. And uh, I'm sharing it with you today through a short film. Uh, so I'm just going to use the next few minutes to tell you to give you some context and tell you a little bit about what was on my mind. I come from good people. People who dreamed and loved and, and, and tried to survive. People who were harmed by uh, British colonizers. That kind, of, um, that kind of harm doesn't dissolve. It has lasting effects. It festers, it mutates. When you're stripped of your humanity, what, where do you put your decency? In what vessel do you carry your hope? There was a, a transformative act of violence that took place amongst my ancestors. And down the line, there were some heroic attempts to contain the repercussions. And many were successful. I'm, I'm a beneficiary of those struggles. Of the fact that people chose to wrap their arms around that burden in order to protect the next generation. And so there was healing. And the river was bent. And still, I haven't quite yet reached the shore. Some of us, we go about our lives fairly certain of who we are and where we come from. We take the good that we know and we gather it up with the good that was handed down. We take the distilled lessons of generations that are now part of our blood and bone and we move forward with those tools. Sometimes, without intention, we also carry the harm. It can become a lattice that we don't recognize as part of the structure of our being. Every so often we do catch sight of it. That framework of harm that hasn't quite faded, tucked into the shadows of our awareness. And it's at those times that we must decide what the nature of our relationship is to these histories that we carry. When, when I teach my sculpture students about shadows, we talk about how they're the fact that shadows are volumetric, they're three-dimensional. Outside on a sunny day, a shadow fills the airspace between your head and the ground, between your elbow and the curb. You can enter into it at any point. 
and see it curl across your fingers. It isn't just a two-dimensional dark shape that's flowing over the surface, it has volume. It's just not visible in the air in which it lives. So your shadow always comes up to meet you. These qualities, they reminded me of intergenerational trauma and how often we can't see it until something happens and our perspective is shifted. Until somehow we enter into it and then we realize it's been quietly with us all along. So in this piece, the shadow represents a, a personal history. It flows down from a knife that belonged to my late father. I've built the structure of its shadow so that it remains visible even in the light. And that structure is all of the things that we quietly carry, the record of our lives to this point, a gathering of harm and hope. We can think of the source of light as our attention, highlighting the things that we're consciously aware of. What's your relationship to your shadow? How does knowing the nature of a shadow and knowing that it's an intimate extension of you, how can that help you to grieve, to process? How can it help you to understand and to let go? Can it be another thing that helps bend the river? These are some of the questions I was asking. Thank you.
Good evening, y'all. What's going on? Y'all good? Give it up for everybody who's been on stage. Showing you the film. I was when Dominique walked back, I said, you was whipping that. You better whip material. Oh, a, a wonderful applause for our leader, Emily Hoopalan Sanyo. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you all for coming out on this um, wonderful day of spring. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 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 Thank of meetings, um, minutes, and um, just a little bit about this piece before I go into it. About almost 10 years ago, I was at a workshop for black poets called Kaveh Khan and Toy Derekot, who I called Mama Toy. Um, it was, I believe, the workshop after that she facilitated. And we're walking back to the dorms, and she says to me, Avery, we know what you think about the world, but we don't know what you think of yourself. <laughs> I'm like, it ain't none of your business. <laughs> what you mean what I think I mean? Uh, I'm fly. <laughs> What's good thing about No, ask me what I know about me. <laughs> so um, she said, no, 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 no. Why don't you write about you? I'm like, oh, I don't know why that. I mean, it's so much other stuff to write about. And she was like, um, no, 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 I think you can do this. I think you right now, you can go back to your dorm and you can reach down into your darkest ink and write a poem. I know you can, Avery. What you talking about, Willis? <laughs> uh, okay, whatever. You know, so I went back and I wrote this piece. And I felt like in my darkest ink. So um, when I finished, I ran back to Mom's way. Mom's way, look, 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 look. I, ran, I wrote something in my darkest ink. <laughs> <laughs> and she looked at it and she was like, okay, write more. <laughs> I was like, okay. Um, and the darkest ink thing is a bit fearful. Um, because it's definitely a more vulnerable space. Um, and, but what I learned is that the darkest ink is not necessarily reserved for the trials and the tribulations of life. The darkest ink is like the documentation of all your triumphs. Like, I'm still here, in spite of that. I'm still here, despite of that. You know, I'm still here, <laughs> I'm still here. So this is a piece that I believe is like a darkest ink piece. Um, and it's titled, County Doctor. Yeah. 
cut that boy's feet off. Dear County Doctor, so this book
as you're leaving, there's some tokens. Um, there's a small gift bag with a tiny mirror. We hope that tonight was an opportunity for reflection and that you look in that mirror and remember. There's a space to leave a word of wisdom or take a word of wisdom. And if you are interested in knowing more about how we made this work, Elizabeth Miles, who did all of the video film work, has, uh, is in the process of making a documentary on the making of Making Ourselves Whole. And in about a month from now, we will show the film and be in video conversation. So, um, and if you um, enjoy tonight, we, will, we did film the entire evening and it will be available for those who could not be here. So um, I want to, again, thank all of you and especially thank the Logan Operations Team and the Center for the Study of Race, Politics, and Culture for supporting our work. Here we go.